All right, we're going to be ready to go in about a minute. I'll let everybody get situated. Go ahead. If you're um, joining us, go ahead and turn to 1 Timothy chapter 1, verses 3 to 7. We're going to cover 1 and 2 Timothy over the next few weeks, months, um, as much as we possibly can. I'm, I'm really thankful that we're able to be here. I'm thankful for the technology that we have to be able to, um, to engage in the word like this. Um, in fact, tonight, I'm a little sad because tonight would have been a great night for our North Lot gathering as far as the temperature was concerned. But as far as the air quality, we certainly don't want people walking away from that, um, having some issues um, in regards to breathing. So I'm really thankful that you're able to be here. Very glad that you're able to be here. And so uh, a couple of things I want to bring to your mind as you're turning to 1 Timothy chapter 1. Um wasn't sure if I was going to do this. I know I'm not getting paid to advertise this, but the the goal of our 3D Wednesdays is 3D disciple disciples discipling. And I thought, man, we need to be continuing to accrue a bunch of materials to be able to help people um, to be discipled. And so this is one that's called the Disciples Bible. It's uh, the the main editor is a gentleman by the name of Robbie Galati, and I would honestly recommend you buying every. If you're interested in discipleship at all, both being a disciple and in making disciples, any book that he has written, I would just encourage you to write to uh, to purchase. But this is um, the Disciples Bible, and what it is at the beginning, um, it's basically where you can go through the Bible in 260 days. But as you uh, as you read through this, let me give you an example here. Like here would be, I just happened to look at here would be day four, and so there's uh, some memory verses that you can go through. As you begin to uh, to move through some of these, we find another thing here. Yeah, so here's another one. So if you're at week three, it says, as you read the Bible this week, highlight the verses that speak to you, explain what this passage means, apply what God is saying in these verses, respond to what you've read. And uh, so over and over, you're, you're called to do memory verses. It gives you a little bit of an update on what's going to be uh, coming up in regards to what you're reading. This is excellent. I mean, this is just an excellent tool. Now, I normally read out of the ESV. This is the Christian Standard Bible. It's published by Lifeway Christian Resources. I really just recommend anything that you can do to engage the scriptures is an absolute win because uh, that, that's what's happening to a lot of us is that we're engaging things that we're hearing all around us, but we're not engaging what the scriptures are having to say. And it's no wonder that we're being, um, we're being flipped and we're trusting in the wrong things, um, and we're we're passing along the wrong things that may look good to us, but we're not being um, we're not being settled in to what the scriptures are having to say. Pardon me. Let me uh, make sure I got this off here, so we're not interrupted. So let's get into First Timothy chapter one, verses three to seven. But before we do that, let's pray. Father, thank you that you've allowed us this time together. Open up your word to our hearts and to our minds. And I pray, Father, that as we go through every word that your word has to say, that uh, it would not be just information and explanation, but that you would apply this to our lives, that we would walk away from this with some takeaways about how we can function better. When we look at this passage, Lord, there's so many things and so many warnings that are regarding um, speculations and just getting into, uh, into things that we may think are really interesting and really kind of fun to talk about when it comes to the scriptures, but if we're not careful, we can we can be leading our friends and our relatives, our associates, our neighbors, our church family, we can be leading them astray. So help us not to do that, Father. And Father, I pray that um, as we continue to move forward, that you would have us to be disciples, not just simply students of the Bible, but helping others to be changed by what your word has to say. Guide us in Jesus' name. Amen. So join me, if you will. What's up, Mark? Good seeing you, bud. Um, join me, if you will, in 1 Timothy chapter 1, again, verses 3 to 7. It says this. As I urged you when I was going to Macedonia, remain at Ephesus so that you may charge certain persons not to teach any different doctrine, nor to devote themselves to myths and endless genealogies which promote speculations rather than the stewardship from God that is by faith. The aim of our charge is love that issues from a pure heart and a good conscience and a sincere faith. 
Certain persons, by swerving from these, have wandered away into vain discussion, desiring to be teachers of the law, without understanding either what they are saying or the things about which they make confident assertions. All right, so here we are. Now, Timothy is, is starting right into it. I'm sorry, Paul with Timothy is starting right into it. And I love this because right away you begin to see that Paul is not one who recognizes he can do this by himself. So Paul, as he's going on, he ends up doing three missionary journeys in total. He plants lots of churches. You see the letters that he is writing. You see at the end of 2 Corinthians 11 about the anxiety that he has for the churches along with the physical pain that he is going through. But what we're seeing with, with Paul here is that he is constantly raising up leaders. That's what we call, we're talking about being and making and multiplying and sending. It's the multiplying aspect where we're not only, we're multiplying not just disciples, but we're multiplying leaders who will lead more small groups, who will meet, lead more churches, who will lead more um, more little groups of, of people who are learning how to be disciples and how to make disciples. And so I love this. The Apostle Paul is making it really clear that he cannot do any of this by himself. And so he says, as I urged you when I was going to Macedonia, so he's saying to remain at Ephesus. Now here's the, here's the task that, the, that uh, Timothy has, that the Apostle Paul gave Timothy, that you may charge certain persons not to teach any different doctrine, nor to devote themselves to myths and endless genealogies which promote speculations rather than the stewardship from God that is by faith. Now we can go into a lot of different rationales and a lot of different understandings about what was being taught here. But the fact is, is that we're seeing this all through the New Testament. The Judaizers were ones who were taking the law and putting into into place and, and into, into such an effect to where they said, not only do you have to trust in Christ, but you have to keep all of the ceremonial laws as well in order to be saved. You had to be circumcised in order to be saved. And we could go into a lot of depth on this, but but the idea here is that they are reading the, the Old Testament law and imposing it on New Testament people when it's something that Christ has already fulfilled. Christ fulfilled all of the ceremonial law, all of the ritual laws. But we are still called to fulfill the moral law, not to be saved, but as an outworking of our salvation. And we're going to see that in the next paragraph a little more, a little more clearly. But this is the idea is that Paul had a set of doctrines, but it wasn't just about the doctrines. He had Christ that he was presenting. And all of the doctrines that he was looking at were ones that were focused on exalting Christ, not simply exalting self or not simply exalting your works, but exalting Christ. And when you exalt Christ, then what happens is you begin to not only love God with everything that you have because you know him through Christ, but now you know how, what it means to love your neighbor. And you begin to put yourself aside and you begin to live sacrificially, selflessly. And this is what is actually happening here. They were taking God's law and they were leveraging it to make it make, make them look good. They were doing it for selfish reasons. But what happens here? It says they were promoting speculations. Now, before we get all over the people that are here, we do this as well. I mean, think about the, some of the things that we may post that we think that, well, it's, it's really of God, but it may be leaning into our political leanings. Either way, it may be leaning to how we grew up or how we think church should be. And it's like what we were talking about on, on uh, Sunday from Mark 7. We're adding things in. We're adding little things in to make it seem like that this is really what church is supposed to be. This is what it really means to be someone who is, who is holy. And, and all. And it really what it is, it's just making ourselves look good by adding all of these different things that may have a little tinge of the things of God, but are not part of the real thing. And when we start doing that, then what we're doing is we're showing the world something that Scripture never intended to show, that Jesus never intended to show. If you go to verse 5, the aim of our charge, our charge, uh, the Apostle Paul and Timothy when they were charging people to make sure that they weren't following these wrong speculations, what was the motive? 
the motive was not selfishness on their part. So, no, I don't want you to lo listen to their selfishness. I want you to listen to my selfishness. No. The aim of our charge is love. And that word in the Greek, agape, a selfless, sacrificial love. Why? Because we are sacrificing our all, not for ourselves. We're sacrificing our all for Christ. And look at the at the at the Trinity that's here, the triune understanding. It's our charge is love. Now it's issuing from, and here's the three: a pure heart, a good conscience, and a sincere faith. A good a, a pure heart. In other words, there's no selfish motives in there. The purity of of heart, the purity of your motives, is to intend to glorify God in every single way that you can possibly glorify Him. That. Whenever there's something that may be selfish, you will repent of that and you will put it aside and you will turn from it. That's what repentance is. But you will also turn to Christ. And then it says here, a good conscience. A conscience is basically whatever that moral understanding is that you may have. And so um, every every worldview, everything has has a conscience to where it is basically a code that you live by, an ethical code that you live by, and when you violate it, then you violated your conscience. For for instance, there's certain groups that used to not anymore, but certain groups they used to used to love caffeine. Or they or, or I'm sorry, there's certain groups that um, they believe they couldn't drink caffeine, and so if they were to drink caffeine then they were violating their conscience. Although there may be nothing in the scriptures that would say that, that there's a problem with that. It was a code that they that they had. Now, a good conscience is, is a conscience that is an ethical code that is good. I mean, as you're going to see later on, Paul is never saying that the law is bad. Our use of the law is bad. But God's law is good because God is good. He's the one that gave his law. He's the one that shows us how to live for him. But when we get into this, we see a good conscience is that you are allowing love, the love of God, to motivate you and move you. And, and the, that love is motivated by truth. And the truth has to be applied in love. That's where Ephesians 4.15 comes in. You speak the truth in love. They both have to work together. A sincere faith. And every, every faith as an object. You don't just have faith and faith. You, you, you have, there, there's an object of your faith. And the object of our faith is Christ, who fulfilled the law, but is also the one who, as, as one writer said, he's the law of love. I love that. And it's, and it's sincere that you're, you're, not, you're not of two minds. You're focused on Christ. Now, the implication of this is that the rest of these who were around him were not operating from a pure heart. They were operating from a selfish heart. That they were not operating from a good conscience. They were, they were being involved in absorbing so many different speculations and myths and genealogies. And they were, they were constructing all of this to make some sort of amalgam of faith that was a test of faith that their conscience was not something that was being operated by the by God's law and God's will and God's way. No, it was being operated by something else that they themselves had constructed. And again, it's a cautionary tale for us. What are we saying to people about what it what it means to be faithful and and in the faith of Jesus Christ? Are we bringing all this uh, this extra stuff in that it, that we may believe that it's good. And again, I just want to remind you, whenever you're able to say, I can't worship unless, and then whatever it is you're filling in that blank with, and it's not having to do with Christ and what's in his word, then you may have found your idol. And so we've got to be careful not to add some of that stuff in because it's very, very easy to do. So let's look at verses six and seven as we close certain persons. So again, these are persons that are in the church. These are not people that are on the outside. These are people that are in the church that are operating from a selfish and a contentious manner. And they're the ones that are, that have swerved from these pure heart, good conscience, sincere faith, and have wandered into a vain or another word, a meaningless conversation, a meaningless uh, discussion. 
I mean, it, it doesn't have any eternal value at all. Because they themselves want to be a teacher of the law. They look up and see someone. They may have seen Paul. They may have seen Timothy. And they're like, wow, everybody's listening to them. I want to be that. But but they want to be clever. And we have a bunch of people who are, who are clever, who are charlatans. I mean, people who are trying to sell books uh, and, and, and are on TV, and yet they're, they're making this amalgam of faith. And it's, it, it's part Christianity, part New Age, prosperity gospel, where they believe that it's just about you and finding your destiny. And you don't hear them talk about confessing their sin, repenting and trusting in Christ and Christ alone. Listen to these people. And whenever you begin to pick up a so-called Christian book, or you begin to listen to these Christian, find out what they're asking you to confess and repent of, even if they even use that language. Sometimes the language that they end up using is that you need to confess from not believing that God thinks you're absolutely fantastic and awesome. Well, you are, but he also tells us that we are objects of wrath like the rest of mankind because we ourselves have chosen to follow the prince of the power of the air, the spirit that's at work in the sons of disobedience. There some of these some of these people you will never hear that out of them, but that's what the word of God is saying. We have to see where we've broken the law, so that we know why we need to be saved and the one who can save us. But getting back to this, they desire to be teachers of the law. They want to be clever. They want to have people just gather around them. They want to, as it says later on in the second letter of Timothy to have someone to come along and tickle their itching ears, to tell them what they want to hear. How often do we go into a church and we have a checklist that may be simply a personal preference or a tradition that we've grown up in that has really no basis in the Bible, but it's just something that we prefer, but it's a test of faith that we put on other people. We've got to be really careful about that, of thinking that when we have liberty to do things, to think there's only one way to do things. We have to be sure that we are following what Christ has told us to do and to be able to make sure that we're not putting extra on people that he didn't intend to put on. They desire to be teachers of the law without understanding either what they're saying. So they're up there and they're talking, but they don't, they don't understand what they're talking about or they don't understand the things about which they make confident assertions. In other words, they're talking in a meaningless way, making assertions that they may not even believe themselves, but they think it'll play to the audience. Let me just give you an, a, an understanding real quick of three things that you need to recognize when something is not fully Christian, fully, a believer, fully believing. Number one is this, they deny the deity of Christ. They deny the, the fact that Jesus Christ is the second person of the God. But he is. Secondly, they deny his resurrection. They think he's just a great teacher, great prophet, but um, you know he he didn't end well. And they can't believe in their system that Jesus would rise from the dead. But he did. And in fact, First Corinthians fifteen makes it clear that uh, if Jesus is not raised, then um, that our faith is in vain, our preaching is in vain. It doesn't matter. There's nothing to what we're believing. That's that's the key, that's how key the, the resurrection is. But here's the third one, and it's that. They don't believe in salvation by grace through faith. They believe that salvation is what, based on what you do, not on what Christ has done. And so it, are we ones we, who are saying this is the weight of salvation, but then in how we act at church, in our small groups, day to day, we add something else on to say this is what has to happen. Now, Jesus has given us that, and it's the law. The Ten Commandments are still in play on how we are to live out our Christian life. Just read the book of James. But that's not how we are saved, and we have to make sure that we're not simply just adding our own, as we call them at church, PATs, our own preferences, our own agendas, our own traditions to make ourselves look really, really holy and really, really pious. We've got to be careful about reading this. So as you get into the next chapter, or in the next paragraph, rather, and you look at verses 8 to 11, you begin to see, and we're going to interact with this, you're going to begin to see how the Ten Commandments are still in play for us. But let me know uh, if you have any questions about anything that we've said. 
I'm going to close in prayer right now. And then for those of you that are watching and are part of our ARBC family and you're part of our private page, I'm going to log off here and I'm going to jump on the uh, the private page so that we're able to be a little more open and be able to share a little more freely some of the prayer requests that have come our way. I'm so glad you're here and I hope that this has been of, of help to you. We've got to make sure that we see this cautionary tale of not drifting from scripture, but being in the scriptures every single day, using these tools every single day to make sure that our lives and our, our speech and everything that we are, are pointing completely to Christ. Let me pray for us. Father, if there's anyone here that finds themselves trusting in something else, may this be the day that they're ultimately trusting in Christ. Do we find ourselves getting upset when things don't go our way, even if we have liberty to do things? Lord, that may, that may mean that we're, we're operating by our own, our own way rather than your way. Father, I thank you that you've allowed us to be able to interact with your word. And Father, many of the traditions and many of the things that we have been doing, much of the routine that we have been so used to over the years um, has changed with COVID. But this is an opportunity for us to really evaluate um, what's negotiable, but what's not negotiable. And I thank you, Lord, that no matter what may change in us, that we are committed here at ARBC to making sure that we are preaching the word, that we're discipling, that we're evangelizing, and that we're doing what we can to care for those that are around us, and that we're making sure that we're still engaged in, in, in a baptism, the Lord's Supper, the things that you've called us to do to make sure that we're being reminded of all that you've accomplished for us. May we make much of Jesus in all that we do. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Hey, thank you so much for checking in. And again, in about a minute, however long it takes me to get off of here and get onto the other, um, I'll meet you over there. Um, again, if you happen not to be a part of our ARBC family yet, I'm so glad you're able to join. Uh, please connect up with us and just let us know how the Lord is uh, moving in your heart. And uh, we'd love to have that conversation with you. He is enough. Jesus is enough. Let's make much of Jesus. All right. Bye-bye.